Good morning, everyone. Our firstborn grandson just turned five. And the other day, his name's Leonard, and we call him Leo. And I'm sitting and I'm talking to him. And I say, Leo, did I tell you that I love you? And he looks at me, he calls me Saba, the Hebrew name for grandfather, and he says, Saba, you just did. And, and, and I'm thinking, where do these kids learn this logic? As if to say, did I tell you that I love you? You just did, right? <laughs> well, I'd like to engage you in some analysis of a family of a different sort. And it begins, at least my inquiry with you, with two important biblical figures, not necessarily inspirational bi biblical figures, and I don't say that in a disrespectful way. In many ways, pivotal, important, but not necessarily inspirational. And I'm speaking of Isaac and Rebecca. What's important about them, and again, not to in any way impugn their contributions in the Old Testament, is that they are the parents of two twin boys, Jacob and Esau. And I emphasize twin boys. Jacob and Esau, however, are a classic example in a long string of sibling rivalry. Think of Cain and Abel. They compete for their parents' love, attention, affection, and there is palpable, tremendous discord between the two siblings. And I've often felt that the book of Genesis, which gets its name from the Greek translation, the Septuagint, if we were to apply an English or Latin-based title to the book of Genesis, I stand before you this morning and I would advocate naming the book Family. It speaks about creation in passing, it's not a pseudo-scientific work, but it delves deeply into the family dynamic. And here's what's seminal. It's real. It doesn't sugarcoat it. It doesn't divert away and romanticize it in a way that's immature. It's real. It's relatable. The discord the palpable discord between Esau and Jacob. Each was loved by one parent, but felt the other was the more favored son. Each wanted what the other had. I'm reminded of Jill, my wife, my wife and I, our three children with whom we've been blessed. When they were young, our daughters, our firstborn and two sons, so if our son Jason would say, Aaron got this and I didn't, my response would be, well, I love Aaron more. <laughs> and my son would then look at me and say, no, really, Daddy. <laughs> Each brother was too needy to acknowledge the other's needs. But here's the curious thing. After 20 years, literally after two decades, the brothers come together. They come together and they reconcile the discord between them, the hatred that they feel one to the next. And the question that I pose is what changed between them that gave them the foundation, the impetus, that motivation to once again be in the physical presence 
of the brother whom each loathed, one to the next. And I'd like to offer two possibilities, and this is clearly an interpretation with textual foundation, but no doubt speculation. Two possibilities. The first is that each of the brothers wanted to, to use the vernacular, come to grips with his past. There was a desire to reconcile, but perhaps underneath that desire was a deeper go-get, to look within, to allow oneself in a self-analytical way to grow deeper, to understand one's past. And you know as well as I do that it is our collective past that makes us who we are. It is so common, it's become a cliche. And invariably, I would propose that was a motivation. But here's the thing. I mentioned they're twin brothers. And here we can draw from the text itself. The physical description of each brothers is described in the Bible in the Old Testament. Esau was probably muscular and preferred the outdoors. This is an, a, a bit of an anachronism, but do you remember the Marlboro Man? You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I identify with the Marlboro Man, I'm just, just saying. And that probably was Esau. Jacob, on the other hand, was physically slighter and probably preferred the indoors. And again, there's biblical textual substantiation for such a claim. While they're described physically, their physical acumen, the Bible does not say a word about their facial characteristics. They're twin brothers. They come together, and what do they do? They look each other in the face. And what do they see? In a world without mirrors, they see a reflection of themselves. But it's a 20-year-older reflection with gray hair and wrinkles. They come together after 20 years. They're each married. They have children. They've had successes. They've had failures. They've had health problems invariably. They're no different than we are. Times change, but people don't. Not in terms of the core characteristics that defines all humanity. So they look each other in the face, and what do they see? A reflection of themselves. And in a less than rhetorical manner, they ask themselves, not each other, why? Why have I allowed this discord? Not whether I'm justified, not whether that person is undesirable. Why have I allowed it? And then they hug and they embrace. Second possibility. Perhaps the brothers came together because each have reached a certain point in their life that would motivate them to do just that. They've succeeded, at least in whatever terms, in a relative description that would define their own success. And not just materialistically. Each, essentially, to put it in the vernacular, each made it. I asked the question, who shows up at his or her high school reunion? I know it sounds a little funny, but if we analyze that, not uncommonly, high school graduates or college graduates who so-called made it, and again, not just in a materialistic setting. 
I remember my 20th high school reunion, true story. My 20th high school reunion, which occurred, what, about 70 years ago now, I think. <laughs> and uh, someone I knew in high school, I, I, whatever, um, um, comes up to me in the course of brief conversation between him and me. He asks me, uh, Michael, what do you do? What's your career path? And I say, I've studied to become a rabbi. He pauses, and he goes, oh, Michael, that's okay. <laughs> uh, you might be familiar with the cartoonist Pepper and Salt, just to further underscore the point. And I actually cut out this little clip, this little cartoon clip, and uh, I still have it on my desk. And in it, the cartoon artist draws a banner. And on the banner, he writes, 30-year reunion. So, you know, whatever. It could be college or high school. doesn't matter. And underneath the banner, there's a man speaking to a woman. And he says to her, this is my first high school reunion. Previously, I wasn't successful enough. So the brothers come together, and Jacob prepares Jacob, the younger brother, and again, twins, so what you can speculate by minutes younger, not much, you know, not a great period of time between the brother's birth. Jacob prepares gifts for his brother Esau, a whole grouping of gifts, and no doubt valuable gifts. 20-year reunion. And what does Esau say when his brother Jacob presents this whole selection of gifts? He says, no, my brother, you keep those gifts. Yesh li rav. I have enough. I have enough. How many of us can say in our own lives, Yesh li rav, I have enough. My father died last December, a little less now uh, than a year ago. And true story, my father was born in Detroit, Michigan, of course, as was I. And he went to college, ending up in college for two years. He studied engineering, and he dropped out. And he formed a company. And he retires at 43 years old. My father died at 96, a year ago, December. We moved to San Diego. A lot of friends and family in the Midwest, in Detroit. I still have very fond memories as a 13-year-old boy growing up in Michigan, winter sports in particular. And I remember so vividly that virtually every day when I came home from junior high school, what was called junior high school as opposed to middle school, and then high school, virtually every day my father was home. He was home to greet me. And as I got somewhat older, I remember asking my father, Dad, why did you retire so young? And he says to me, Michael, I have enough. It's so stuck with me. I have enough. It wasn't that he was fed up. Though you've heard me say, and I really mean this, I think the businessmen and women and the engineers are the heroes of civilization. The infrastructure that they build, the jobs that they create, the jobs that they create. One of the holiest things, one of the holiest things we can do is provide jobs for others. So he wasn't fed up. He just says, I have enough. Yeshli Rav. Esau 
and I'm speculating here, but again, I have grounds to do so, invariably was happy with what he had, not what he lacked. And that's what's pivotal, what he had. Esau was able literally to say, and we can quote him down to this day, Yeshli Rav. Not I'm fed up, not I'm cynical, not I'm burned out, nothing of the sort. I'm content. I'm satisfied. He still engages in life, no doubt, and I'm not romanticizing the text still has great joy in his life to the end of his life. We have reason to believe that. But he has enough, and by extension, invariably, he becomes quintessentially grateful. Studies have shown that being grateful, being able to say, Yeshli Rav, I have enough, can lead to significant increases in psychological, spiritual, and yes, physical well-being. We're not simplistic thinkers. Of course, there are other elements. Life is a polychrome. It's a number of factors that converge or compete. grateful individuals, those who can say, I've had enough, are much more content with their life. Grateful individuals, those who can say, yeshli rav, are better able to form social bonds. They're better able to defer stress and maintain a positive attitude. There are people who can just suck the air out of the room. Not only because it's about them, 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 because their demeanor is just so negative. Always what's lacking as opposed to what is present. Individuals who can say, Yeshli Rav, I have enough, are more creative and problem solving. They have greater satisfaction in relationships. They are more humble. They have a more defined, developed spiritual side. 1,000 years later, 1,000 years after the passing of Jacob and Esau, twin brothers who come together, look each other in the face, the one brother says upon being offered genuinely, lovingly, given gifts, Yeshli Rav. 1,000 years after their passing, the Talmud, which is an encyclopedia of rabbinic thought, arcing all aspects of life. The question is raised, who is rich? To which the Talmud offers the answer, he or, he or she who can say, I have enough. Yeshli Rav. So I leave you with this question. Can you say it? Can you say, Yeshli Rav, I have enough? I know audibly you can say it. We can say it. I can say it. But more importantly, can you say it and mean it? That, my dear friends, is the challenge. Good morning, everyone.